You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Ahaz rejected the grace of God. It's that simple. That's what he did. As we talked earlier, when God made the offer to King Ahaz, he's also making an offer to you at this point in time. Right now is the time for salvation. There's things going on that you can be scared about right now. But God's in control. He's never not been in control. He's completely in control. And now is the day of salvation. Now's the time to place your trust in Jesus Christ. God gives each of us an opportunity to receive the gift of grace. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But we're freely given the opportunity to receive it. King Ahaz rejected God's grace and that King Ahaz rejected God's grace and that led to the destruction of a nation. He worshiped other gods, built temples against him, and defied his instructions. In today's message, Pastor Ken is going to encourage you to live with God and not against him. God wants to give you the gift of grace. All you have to do is be willing to accept Jesus as the Lord of your life. Well, Let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, as he continues his message, King Ahaz, the Lily Livered. King Isaiah has been, well, King Ahaz, rather, has been talked to by Isaiah directly. It's you, you, King Ahaz. It's all about Ahaz. But in verse 14, you goes from being in the singular to being in the plural. He's not talking to one person anymore. It's a broader audience. In other words, for those of us who are from the South, he's no longer talking about y'all. He's talking about all y'all. Okay, that's that. It's a plural you. Now that now that we have it clear, he's talking to the Davidic line, all the future kings, all those who gonna who come from David. He's talking to the nation too. All those who are Jews, all of them. Ahaz has just made a decision that will impact the nation for centuries to come. This is a sign. It's a big one. And it has a big beginning. The word Isaiah uses when he starts this in verse 14 is he says, behold. Now there's a formula in the Mesopotamian area for announcing really important births. And it uses the word behold to start it. If it's just a normal birth, you won't say anything. But when you say behold, it's kind of like, attention, attention. This is a very important thing that we're talking to you about. This is an important birth. We know that because this ancient formula is now being followed. Isaiah understands how important this, this, this announcement is. He understands it, so he takes that formula and he begins to use it. His reason for doing so was to attract attention to the announcement itself, because Ahaz has blown it. And if others were around him at that time, Ahaz and the members of his court and the water guys and all that, if they were familiar with the formula, they would have immediately known that what he's talking about is of supreme importance. Isaiah is not to declare the birth of any child. He's going to declare the birth of a significant child. The term being used, behold, means as the listener, as the reader, pay attention to what he's saying. This is really, really important. Verse 14 is highly important. The number one point that many take offense to, by the way, of verse 14 is the word virgin. They don't like that. Matthew made it clear for us. He he brings it up in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. There's no doubt, because here's how Matthew reads it. Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way. While his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, to be, was a righteous man, and because he did not want to disgrace her, he intended to divorce her privately. When he had contemplated this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son, and you'll name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. This all happened so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did what the angel of the Lord told him. He took his wife, but did not have marital relations with her until she gave birth to a son, whom he named Jesus. Matthew quotes Isaiah 7, 14, right there in the, right in the body of it, and he says it's a virgin, virgin birth. Matthew uses the text that's from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. And the rabbis, who understood after, after they read it, they used the best Greek word they could to capture the meaning of that word Alma, which is what it is in the Hebrew. They used the Greek word Parthenos. Parthenos in the Greek means virgin, one who has never had sexual intercourse, who is chaste, one who is a virgin. That's what it means. The Septuagint uses that word. Matthew uses that word. Or you go to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a Parthenos, a virgin, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, the descendants of David, and the Parthenos name, virgin's name, was Mary. There it is again. It's the same word. It's unambiguous. It all means virgin. So where does the confusion come from? Especially when we consider that in the commissioning back in chapter 6, Isaiah was told not to be ambiguous. He's supposed to speak clearly so that people can understand what he's saying. So you have to remember that too. He's being very, very clear. So is there something culturally that we're not picking up on here? Uh, possible, very possible. But the problem, uh, Bruce Compton points this out, the problem comes in harmonizing chapter, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 as a sign to Ahaz in the 8th century B.C. with Matthew's use of the reference in the 1st century, 3 B.C. is when Jesus was born. So, you know, that, that they're, trying to, they're trying to, well, how can it be that? And how can it be this? And therefore, it has to be something else. They're, but the rabbis had no problem. They understood what it meant. As you look at commentaries and research, verse 14, it becomes clear that there are actually three ways that people look at this verse. And by the way, the verse the, the, in verse 14 that, is, that we see as virgin is the Hebrew word Alma. And it means in the Hebrew, a marriageable girl, a girl who's able to be married, a young woman. But there's more to it. There's some cultural stuff that we're not getting in the definition. There is a Hebrew word that means virgin. It's betula. It means a grown-up girl without any sexual experience with men who has no husband can also, though, mean someone who's been widowed. So that's not a word that he did use. He didn't use that one. The center of all of this, Dr. Feinberg points it out, is the word Alma. There's a lot of stuff written about it, and there's going to be more stuff written about it as we go on. Is there an element of ambiguity into it, or is this simply because people are trying to interpret it and they don't want to think in terms of a miracle. I, okay. I think it's because they don't want to think about a miracle. They don't want to understand that this really is God with us and that he is born of a virgin. Jesus Christ was. And if that is all true, then I got to do something with that personally. And a lot of people don't want to have to face the moral issues as a result of understanding that they're responsible to Jesus Christ. They're responsible to God. Now, remember again the commissioning from chapter 6. Isaiah was to be very clear. He's not ambiguous here, okay? Now, some would say that if Isaiah had really wanted to denote virginity, he would have used betula. Again, we talked about that word, which means primarily virginity. However, again, it's used of widows and others who were no longer married but had been married. A betula can be a woman of any age. So that's tough to put a specific sign to it. The evidence supports both the traditional translation of virgin and the modern translation of young woman, but each must be qualified. The English term virgin does not suggest age limitations, while the English phrase young woman does not suggest virginity. The word alma takes both those words, and to be accurate, it demands that it be translated young virgin. And by the way, the other places it shows up in the scripture, it's always referencing a virgin. 
it's not referencing some young woman. So, I mean, let's just lose this, this idea and this problem. There's not a problem. These are people who want to do away with the miraculous. They want to grasp at some argument that, oh, this word means something else. It doesn't. They don't try to understand the culture and the usage of the word that Isaiah has specifically chosen to use under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he's writing. I remember again the rabbis who translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. They knew what it meant. They clearly understood the term meant virgin. And that's the word they used when they translated it. They used the Greek word parthenos. So back to the three ways that we can view this section of Scripture in terms of a, of a prophecy. The first view is it's historical and they just stop there. Well, it's not. Matthew used this verse and he pointed to the birth of Christ. So this is not a valid view. A second view is you look at this as messianic only with the fulfillment only taking place with the birth, birth of Jesus Christ. There's something to that. There's another view, which is that there's two fulfillments, one being in the near future and one in the far off future. So one's pointing towards someone who's going to be born very, very soon and one who's going to be born very, very late, which is Jesus. So the far fulfillment would be Jesus. The near fulfillment would be somebody that Ahaz is familiar with. So again, but why the fear in Ahaz? Now, yeah, he, he fears he's going to get whacked. But there's also a fear to the end of the Davidic line. He thinks that if I'm killed and everybody's killed, then the promise that has been made to David will never take place, uh, even though he may not even believe it himself. But there are others who have that fear. There's a fear that more would arise from those familiar with the prophecy to David rather than Ahaz himself specifically, but it might be in the back of his mind. The, the thing is, is that if Syria and if Israel attack and kill him and kill all of his family, then there's no one who can be Messiah, is, is what he's thinking. The, and you have to remember at this point in time, each of these kings thought, well, the Messiah is going to come from me. I've been, it's been promised of David. Maybe I'm the one who's going to have a child who's the Messiah. And what the prophecy here is, is that, no, Ahaz, you guys don't need to worry about that. I've got this handled. I'm going to point all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and it's going to be of a virgin you won't be involved in it at all. In the Hebrew, the phrase, by the way, has an article in front of it, ha alma. It means the virgin. There's only one, just one. Her name is Mary. The Septuagint also, in the Greek, has that article in front of Parthenos, the virgin. Okay, So you have to focus in on the language sometimes. This is a one-time sign. That's what's being given here. Behold, behold, that's an important announcement. This is a one-time sign, a one-time miracle, a one-time event, and one that is so significant that it has the word behold at the beginning of it. This is a prediction of the coming of the king, of the coming of Messiah, of, who is born of a virgin, Mary, in a little place called Bethlehem. That's what, that's what it's all about. But Ahaz and all of those who were with him were fearful that, well, you know, if I die, the Davidic line's going to die, and there won't be this dynasty anymore, and we won't see the prediction take place. And, and what Isaiah is saying is that's not a problem. Yep, the prophecy to David's house and the nation is still there. It's still going to be fulfilled. But the first part, and there's two parts to this prophecy here. The first one says Jesus' birth is going to be miraculous. It's going to be of a virgin. The Davidic line will be preserved, but it's going to be pointing back to Genesis chapter 3, and it's going to be of a virgin birth. Again, you is plural in verse 14, but then as you go forward into verse 15, you'll see the word you again in verse 16. So the boy will know enough to refuse good and evil, the land whose two kings you dread. You dread. You. Okay? So you have the first verse, the verse section of it in verse 14, the coming Messiah. That promise has not been abrogated, but no longer should any king, any member of the line of David worry about that, oh, I'm going to give birth to the Messiah. That nah, ain't happening. It's going to be a virgin birth. Verse 15 and 16 is a separate unit. These verses are parallels. In other words, there's three things mentioned in them. 
and the parallelism is, is a characteristic of the Hebrew language. So again, in chapter 7, verse 14, this is for the nation. Therefore, the Lord himself will give all y'all, plural, you plural, a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Now, this is for Ahaz. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you, singular, dread, will be forsaken. What he's saying is because of your unbelief, Ahaz, you have personally jeopardized the promises made to David, but they're going to happen. Messiah is coming for the nation. That's a given fact. That's not going to, that's not going to change. But Ahaz, because of your actions, he's going to be born in less than ideal conditions. Because of his unbelief, the promised Messiah would be born into poverty. He's going to be heir to a, a, a meaningless throne in a conquered land, Rome, okay? Israel in the time of Rome. Isaiah said this without qualification because at that moment, it was the only way he could express the significance of what Ahaz had done and what the events are that now have to run their course. But the mind-blowing promise is the sign that Isaiah has just provided to King Ahaz. The promised Messiah is going to be virgin-born. The idea that a king of David's line would have anything to do with it is a thing of the past. It's not going to have anything to do with it. So when will this happen, and how will this happen? Well, the hint is in verse 15 and 16. Messiah will not be born into riches. He's not going to be born into a palace like Ahaz was like Hezekiah is going to be. He's not, he's not going to be born into riches. By the way, Ahaz, before he's born, Syria and Israel, Samaria, as nations as you know them today, they won't exist. They won't be around anymore. The Davidic line, though, will continue because Messiah is going to come from that line, supernaturally. But because of you, King Ahaz, the conditions of his birth will be very different than the conditions of your birth. Verse 17, the Lord will bring on you, on your people, and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. Have you picked up on the fact that this is no longer a happy conversation that, that Isaiah is having with King Ahaz? It's just not. Isaiah is being brutally direct in his language. When Ahaz made what he thought was a shrewd decision, he was acting on behalf of the entire nation, and his rejection ends up being a huge pivot point for all of Israel, and it results in a promise to all of us that the, the Messiah is going to come as a result of a virgin birth. I mean, it's just amazing, the promise that comes from this. What had been a state secret that Isaiah was considering turning to Assyria, Isaiah knows, and he's going to make it very public. And he makes a comparison, though, to the original days of the Civil War in 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles 11. Now, those were dark days. The kingdom constructed by Yahweh with David and Solomon was systematically torn apart, and he's comparing it to that. The majority of the tribes went north, and they turned to idolatry. The Levites, who were in the north came south. We see that in 2 Chronicles eleven fourteen, They left their pasture lands, and they had to come south because Jeroboam, who was the king who formed the northern kingdom, they prohibited them from serving as the Lord's priests. So they had to, if you loved the Lord, you came south. If you loved idols, you went north. But because of the rejection of the grace of God, this is what Ahaz has now chosen for his people. He's chosen the same thing. Ahaz thinks he's going to ally himself politically with Assyria. He thinks it's a good deal. Be careful what you wish for, Ahaz, because you're going to get it, and it's not going to be exactly what you think it's going to look like. So he's being told, this is what it's going to look like, and it's not anything like you thought. Seeking help from Assyria, basically he took a tiger by the tail. He's not going to get security. Faith would give him security. But because of him, there is now a dynastic threat. So the, the, the dynasty of King David is, is at threat. God's just told him there's going to be someone from David when the Messiah is born, but it's going to be way off in the future. 
the conditions of the birth won't be like you had been born. And there's going to be a loss of seven, sovereignty too. We're going to see that. It's going to be worse than losing 10 tribes. That was bad, but it's going to be worse than that. So Isaiah concludes verse 17 by making it clear for Ahaz, the coming events are coming because of your rejection. All of this is going to occur because of the one you think will help you, the king of Assyria. I mean, if this was a, this would be a classic place for Isaiah as he's talking to, the, to King Ahaz. He says, and all this is going to happen, the king of Assyria, and then drop the microphone at that point and walk away. But he doesn't. He then starts to outline for King Ahaz in the next few verses exactly what it's going to look like. So let's take a look at verses 18 to 25. In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that's in the land of Assyria. They'll all come and settle on the steep ravines and on the ledges of the cliffs and all the thorn bushes and all the watering places. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired from regions beyond the Euphrates, that is with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs. It will also remove the beard. Now in that day, a man may keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep, and because of the abundance of milk produced, he'll eat curds, and everyone that is left within the land will eat curds and honey. It'll come about in that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines valued at a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. People will come there with bows and arrows because all the land will be briars and thorns. As for all the hills which used to be cultivated with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but they'll become a place for pasturing oxen and for sheep to trample. So here's the coming events for you, King Ahaz. This is what your decisions led to. One, the Lord's going to call for the armies of Egypt and Assyria to devastate Judah. And as we move forward, we'll see that actually happening. Two, the king of Assyria will be the instrument who will humble Judah and King Ahaz. King Ahaz will become a vassal and will be in humiliation as a result of it. Assyria, though, is not going to stop with just taking over Syria and Israel. They're going to continue to press against Judah. And he thinks that that won't happen. All the signs, this is three, all the signs of economic wealth, well, that all goes to Assyria. They get all the money and they leave you destitute because you're a vassal. Number four, you won't have any crops. The reason being is that there's going to be this marauding army in the land all the time, and they're going to eat all your food. All you'll have left to eat is the food of a pauper. But the population is going to seriously decline as a result. Five, the vineyards will become abandoned, and they're going to only be useful for cattle. You're not going to be using them for making wine anymore. And all of this is fulfilled in the very near future. We'll probably cover some of it as we go through the book of Isaiah. That ends the conversation in the field. King Ahaz had grace offered to him by Yahweh, but he knew better, and he used God talk to try and solve the problem. He was looking for peace, safety, and a long life. His decision did not provide for peace, safety, or a long life. And Judah will wind up being a speed bump for the armies of Egypt and Assyria as they go back and forth attacking each other. Ahaz rejected the grace of God. It's that simple. That's what he did. As we talked earlier, when God made the offer to King Ahaz, he's also making an offer to you at this point in time. Right now is the time for salvation. There's things going on that you can be scared about right now. But God's in control. He's never not been in control. He's completely in control. And now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to place your trust in Jesus Christ. Because you decided to stay tuned, you've just been a part of the Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Do you know how glad it makes our hearts to know you're investing time in your relationship with Jesus? So much. In fact, would you connect with us and share a little about what's been happening in your life and how this radio ministry has affected you? The unsafebible.com has a space for you to do just that. Go to the Connect tab at the side and then click on the Connect card. Once there, fill out the form and then we'll be sure to touch base with you. 
Pastor Ken's message from Isaiah today left me reflecting on my own life and how I treat people. Do I treat them how I want to be treated? Do I give them the cold shoulder when I feel like it? Or do I choose kindness over retaliation? Isaiah was one of the major prophets that confronted some of these common issues we still face today. You don't want to miss any of these teachings. Trust me. If you already have, don't sweat it. We have your bases covered. Just go to the unsafebible.com and click on Media. There you'll find this and other messages to listen to. If Go, Go, Go is your middle name and you can't seem to find a still moment, you can follow us via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We'd also like to personally invite you to attend one of our services. Find all the information you need, including directions at our website. And just in case you've forgotten, it's the unsafebible.com. We hope to meet you soon. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Come back again for more of the Unsafe Bible.